There's some that are pathogens well, of birds too. Correct. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Thank you. Jane Draper, who is our speaker for this uh, seminar. And uh, uh, well, she has a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Cambridge. This is uh, Cambridge is where she first met um, carcinogens, and after she saw them, she was hooked for life. So that's why she decided to keep working with these. And uh, af uh, after this, uh, she was she was an associate professor in the Department of Microbiology at the New York University uh, School of Medicine, where she focused on the host parasite interaction of African carcinogens and primates. And currently, she is the principal investigator in the Department of Biological Sciences in Hunter College at City University of New York, where she is currently managing a program um, to generate transgenic cows that will be resistant to all forms of African trypanosome, which are eight species. And she's currently working with um, uh, one uh, breed of cattle and hopefully being able to move into all the breeds of cattle so that all cattle are um, protected against your time zone. And this will help uh, um, small holder farmers to raise cattle in the Tsetse fly belt in Sub-Saharan Africa and potentially eliminate a reservoir of human infected parasites. So please help me in welcoming Jay Ripper. Thank you. All righty. You poor things, you've been at this since nine o'clock this morning. <laughs> You know, if you need to stand up and walk around, I don't mind in the slightest. Much better than you going to sleep. All right, so I've been asked a few questions about what kind of trypanosomes are these. So these are African trypanosomes that are illustrated on this slide in this distribution. They're extracellular parasites, and they swim around in the blood and extracellular spaces of your body or a cow's body or any mammalian body. They are... Um, what's known as a zoonosis, so they infect any animal, every animal. What I show you here, so they're not Tepranosoma cruzi, which are an intracellular parasite that likes to live in muscle, particularly muscle surrounding the heart, or muscle surrounding your esophagus, or muscle surrounding your colon. And in those instances, it causes flaccidity of that muscle mass, and so your heart will stop beating, your esophagus will stop doing peristalsis, or your colon will stop performing peristalsis. So those are the diseases called by the South American trypanosome, which is known as cruzi. We're talking about the African trypanosome, of which there are many species. So originally, African trypanosomes are thought to have arisen here in Africa. And this line here is the tsetse fly belt. And those insects transmit this parasite by biting one animal and transferring them to an uninfected animal. There is an entire life cycle in this tsetse fly. So that is unlike the rest of the flies, which are these biting flies. So the biting flies are distributed here, here, and here. These are like flying syringes they will bite the infected animal and immediately bite another infected animal. And that's how they transmit the parasite. So there is no development whatsoever in these flies. Okay. So here in Tetsi land was where the original trypanosomes became animal infective. And unfortunately, they got on boats, the animals did, and they traveled to this part of the world, or they cross land mass and traveled to this part of the world. And so now this parasite has spread way beyond its African borders. So we know very well about all of the disease in this part of the world, but people don't really ever talk about the fact that this parasite has spread in domestic animals quite far. So here's the parasite of my life the love of my life, I should say. Um, it's swimming around in blood, and so you can see it kind of looks like a worm, but these circular things that look like uh, Cheerio cereal are in fact red blood cells. And so this parasite is quite small. It's, this, it's a single cell eukaryote. So by that I mean it has, it's a lengthwise, it'd, it'd be about as long as a white blood cell, but it's super skinny, okay? So this is not a worm. This is a single cell parasite. 
And the reason it can live in your blood like this is it's covered in a surface coat all the way over the outside of it, which we call the variant surface glycoprotein. And what this parasite does is, here you are, you've got a parasite with a red coat. When your immune system recognizes that as foreign, it, you'll raise red antibodies to it, and you'll clear that just like you would any microbe. But whilst you're busy clearing this, the parasite changes its coat. And so now it puts on a pink one, and then it puts on a purple one, and then it puts on a blue one, and it can keep on doing this ad infinitum. So every time you recognize it and kill it, it just changes its coat. So it always wins, always wins this battle. And eventually it will cross the blood-brain barrier, it will grow in your cerebral spinal fluid, you'll go into a coma, and then you'll die. This parasite always wins. So the only cure for the animals and for the humans is chemotherapy, right? Some kind of drug. But once that drug has worked and you get reinfected, you have to take that drug again. Because the parasite will just put on different coats. So it doesn't matter if you have memory, it doesn't matter, it will just put on a different coat. Okay? So the focus of our research is actually to try and help the situation in Africa. But there is nothing that would not allow this technology to be applicable to the other areas of the world. Governments allowing this technology to occur, of course. So in Africa, you can see here's the tetsi in the pink. And you can see the cattle are mostly outside of Tetsi zone, and then there's a few that are in the Tetsi zone. If these cattle get infected, this is what they look like. The Tetsi, when it bites the cattle, transmits the parasite, and the parasite causes cachexia, which is a muscle-wasting disease. And it's very, very obvious that this cow has, is carrying the parasite. In Africa, there are 60 million cattle, we use 30 million doses a year of trypanosidal drugs. We lose about 3 million cattle annually, and many thousands of humans get the disease. So whilst it's terrible to get the disease if you're a human, you can have chemo and you can be treated, and we don't lose many human beings to death anymore. But the issue is the cattle, because 90% of the crops in sub-Saharan Africa, and correct me if I'm wrong, those of you who come from Africa, are produced with animal power. Sorry, without animal power, because people can't afford to have a cow, or if they can, it looks like this, and it's not particularly functional for pulling plows, carrying things, and being used to do agriculture. And so most of the tilling is done by hand. Yes. With the location the ecological because if the soil is dead, animals cannot be able to work on it. But all those areas that have nice soil, sandy soil. Oh, so you mean here and here? Nice other nice soils, animals are used for them. So you're saying in the in the wet zone here? Especially the West Africa and part of West Africa. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Do you want animals? Yes. Do they still want animals there? Would they like them for milk and for carrying things? Plow, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, no, I, I, need, I need input and I need to know facts from people on the ground. So um, all is not lost, so here's our tetsi fly, 
and it will transmit many animal infected parasites and you can see here that the cow is dead and upside down. You'll notice though that the human is alive and well and that's because circulating in our blood we have a factor that protects us from all of the animal infected parasites. So that factor I've depicted here is this yellow blob and we've nicknamed or given this factor the name trypanosome lytic factor because what it does is it lyses African trypanosomes. Okay, so we, we name it purely by what it does. And so you can see if a testy fly bites a human with any of these animal infected parasites, we will effectively kill them and we won't be infected. Whereas the cow doesn't have this and so it will be infected and it will ultimately die. So this isn't, um, let me see what I've got next. All right, so the trypanosomes are domestic animals that we can kill. Notice here I've written primates because as we get further into this talk, you'll see that there are other primates that carry this factor. So there's Congolensi, Vivax, Suisse in pigs, Brucei infects all of these different animals, Evansi, and then Equiperdum. This one is sexually transmitted. So this is the only one that you don't need flies for of any kind. All the others are transmitted either by biting flies or by tsetse flies. This one is prevalent outside of Africa. So Vivax is the one that's moved successfully into South America and Asia and Polynesia and those areas. Okay, so that's the one that successfully moved out of Africa. So we can kill every single one of these parasites. Every single one of you in this room that's never even seen a trypanosome, though I hope some of you have, are perfectly capable of killing these parasites because you have this lytic factor circulating in your blood. Yes? Uh, what about brucey and sleeping disease? We'll get there. So what is this lytic factor? So it's something that you may have heard of in your life called the good cholesterol. So there are two kinds of cholesterol that are in circulation in your blood. There's the good stuff and there's the bad stuff. So those of you who like to eat hamburgers or cream or cookies or anything with high fat, high cholesterol, you're going to put a lot of bad cholesterol into your blood right? And slowly over the years, that bad cholesterol is going to coat your arteries, and slowly your arteries are going to close, and then one day you'll either have a stroke or a heart attack because the blood can't flow anymore. That's called heart disease. Okay, so there's this good cholesterol, this guy here, who runs around picking up all that bad stuff, taking it away from your arteries, taking it to your liver, and turning it into bile. And that's why it's called the good cholesterol. Okay? So what is it? It's a layer of fat here. So all these blue things are the layer of fat. And embedded in it are these red objects. It's kind of like icebergs floating in the sea. And these are uh, protein components that allow us to call this the good cholesterol. Okay? So this is a good guy, and you have all kinds of different things that are red floating objects that attach to this good cholesterol. A multitude of things that have functions that we haven't even figured out yet. But one of the things we do know is it's really good at taking away the bad cholesterol and delivering it to your liver. So the trypanosomalytic factor is one of these really good cholesterols. And I always call it the very good cholesterol because I'm biased, because I like the fact that it kills African trypanosomes. And so it's a very small percentage of the total good cholesterol that you have in circulation, but every single one of you in this room has it. All of you have this. It's got a scaffold, which I've shown in blue here, and that allows us to call this entire complex a, cholesterol a good cholesterol molecule. It's got a couple of other proteins that really help get this entire thing into a parasite. 
So these two things here are this, haptoglobin-related protein and hemoglobin. You all know hemoglobin. It's the content of your red blood cells. These two things really together help increase the parasite to take up more of this molecule. But this is the bad guy, this one in green. It's a pore-forming protein. So what I mean by that is it punches holes in the parasite. And that's what makes the parasite die. Okay, so this is the key. This one is really, really important. Without that, no parasites die. With this, all parasites die. Yes? So the effectiveness of this factor depends on diet? No. No. So this is a uh, factor is in circulation with all of you. It's part of what's called your innate immunity. So you're born with it. Okay, so it doesn't matter what you eat, you're born with it. Yes, diet can, you can, with diet, make more good cholesterol, but not necessarily more of this, per se. Overall, you'll make a lot more of the good cholesterol, but not, we have no evidence showing that you'll make more of this pore-forming protein just because you eat a good diet. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Are there any? Yes. Yes. So we have in circulation something that looks like this, free in circulation in your blood. And so this can compete for the uptake of this by the parasite, right? So because it looks identical as far as the parasite can tell, um, free circulating complexes that look like this will con entirely compete for the parasite consuming this whole complex. That's the only thing we know that we've studied that we're aware of. So what happens in a malarious area where people get malaria, you know that the malaria, I don't know if you know this, but malaria infects your red blood cells and it lyses your red blood cells, yes? And so what you do is you release a lot of hemoglobin, this red stuff, that is inside your red blood cells. What you do then is you load up all of this free stuff that's in circulation, and it gets cleared in your blood. So you don't have any anymore. And what that does then is it enhances the capacity of this to be able to kill the parasite. So in malarious areas where you have anemia or hemolytic events, this has a lot of activity. In us now in this room, because our red blood cells are intact, this has about 10% of its capacity, its capability, because it's competing to get inside the parasite. Does that make sense? So it's triggered by hemolytic events. Yeah, hemolytic events are good for once in our lives, right? A <laughs> hemolytic <laughs> event <laughs> is a good thing in this instance. So that's the only thing we're aware of that affects this activity. There may be other things that we haven't found yet, but it's the only thing we know. So malaria is a good thing to have if you're in Africa and you want to protect yourself from trypanosomes. <laughs> Who thought? Who'd have known? Okay, so how does this guy work? So here's your parasite swimming around in blood. And here's your good cholesterol just floating around in blood, right, trying to find your arteries and clear them up. And what happens is there's this, this um, we call this the mouth of the parasite, but it isn't, right, because this is a single cell, so it doesn't really have a mouth. But we think of it as the mouth of the parasite because this is where it consumes all the nutrients it needs to grow. And so in c this will float in randomly. There's no attraction to this area whatsoever. And once it's in what we call the mouth of the parasite, which is actually really the flagella pocket, it will get taken up by the parasite and delivered to the insides. And the function there is to be chewed up, to be eaten. So you should think of this like the parasite's stomach, right? We consume food, we chew it up, we eat it, and we use it as building blocks to create what we are, what you see. You are what you eat. So it's no different with the parasite. So it's eating this. And when it gets inside, the green guy, the pore-forming protein, 
sticks into the membrane of the parasite and it pokes holes. And when it does that, the parasite swells up like a balloon and then it bursts. Cool. Isn't that cool? Imagine if you ate something, it poked holes in you and you swelled up and you burst. It's basically an osmotic death. Osmotic death. Very good. It's osmotic death. So it's letting in lots of water and the whole thing swells and bursts. And so that's why we call it the trypanosome lytic factor because you can really see that what it does is lies this trypanosome. Got it? Okay. So here's the question somebody asked me, what about human sleeping sickness? So if we have TLF, so we've got this great lytic factor, why do we get infected by trypanosomes? So here we are, human and animal infected parasites. And what happens is it's transmitted by the tsetse fly. And look, dead human. And dead cow also, because these human in parasites can also infect cattle. And then here, of course, if we get infected by the animal ones, we're completely protected because we have this awesome, good cholesterol. There are, actually. To date, so we're not very good at sequencing the entire world yet, in case you hadn't noticed. We're particularly good at sequencing white people, which is not very helpful. <laughs> we're getting better at sequencing people from somewhere else around the world. And very recently, there was a publication where they sequenced 60,000 people around the world. 20% came from Asia and 20% came from Africa. So we're doing a little better. But with the limited data we have, there's probably, to our knowledge, at least 20 different green guys, 20 different variants in circulation around the world. They all kill trypanosomes still. Some kill better than others, right? Because we're not all the same. I mean, look at us. We're clearly not all the same. We, we technically have the same genetic makeup, but obviously little differences in our genetic, in our genes, make us all look different, behave differently. Yes? We know that. You know that. My genes are almost identical to yours, and yet clearly we don't look the same. Yes? Okay. So it's the same for any gene in your body, really. There are little subtle changes, and they'll make your eyes blue, They'll make your eyes green, they'll make them brown, they'll make them black. Good question. Yes. The regions where people die because of uh, trypanosomes, mm -hmm. should we expect that those regions are, like, trypanosome has moved there recently? Because I will expect that selection pressure will have mm -hmm. selected this. So it's already started about 4,000 years ago. So if you look at the distribution of the human disease, we've got this side of Africa, which is called Gambiense, and this side of, uh, on the east coast, we call the parasite Rhodesiense. And that's because they're quite different. I mean, they're very similar, but they've got some s differences. These guys grow fast when they infect a human. They kill you within six months. They're pretty virulent. These ones on this side, they grow slow. They give you chronic infections. People don't even know they've got them half the time. This is the smarter parasite, because you don't want to kill your host. I mean, how do you keep propagating if you kill your host? That's crazy. So these are really successful, and you can see they are spreading over the majority of Africa. Right? Now, what was your question? You can't remember. It's OK. If, uh, the region for Die. Right, right. I think I have that. Okay. All right. So what's happened? I, this is a question for you guys. If you think about it, this is just a parasite that looks pretty much like the animal parasite. This parasite looks pretty much like the animal parasite, and yet something's happened to these parasites that allows them to infect a human being. The right. So you could change the receptor. You could get rid of it so that the parasite couldn't take up so much stuff and it couldn't be lysed? What else could you do? Let's say you don't change the receptor and just as much gets in. What else could you do? 
okay, here I am, I'm walking into the stomach. How are you going to stop me touching you? Push me away, <laughs> push me away, right? That's exactly what happens. So the parasite makes things that push it away so that you can't insert into the membrane and you can't make a hole. And what is that, that story for? It's a protein, it's a protein. So we call it the serum resistance associated protein. It's a total mouthful. But it doesn't matter, you get the concept. You push it away so that it can't make a hole in you. So cool. It's evolution, isn't it great? But, but listen guys, so here, here you are, right, in West Africa, in these countries, the humans changed their gene. And the parasite can't push it away anymore. It's a war. We call it a molecular war. It's molecular evolution, right? So, so the parasite changes to win, and then the human changes to beat the parasite, and guess what's going to happen? The parasite's going to change again one day, I assume, but we'll see. Yes, it's the Red Queen hypothesis. Correct. Got more affected right. areas have the right. highest frequency of the right. Yields. right. So here the frequency has risen to seventy percent. So seventy percent of the population in West Africa have changed their gene. So they can kill the parasite. And then across the rest of Africa, it's about three percent. So the West Africans, you Ghanaians, you're way ahead of the game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, as usual. <laughs> but that's only for Bruce. For all the rest of the species, we all have the idea. Yes, yes. So for every other animal parasite, you're, you're safe. Don't worry. <laughs> but Is Bruce a relatively new species compared to the others? Yes. It is considered so, yes. Great. All right, we're on the game. So, <laughs> there are other primates on this pl planet. There are other primates on this planet besides humans that have this an awesome lytic factor, right? So in case you don't know, this man here is hoping to become the President of the United States of America in a few days time. I don't know if he's human. We haven't tested him. I can't, I can't attest to his genetic makeup whatsoever. Um, but you'll notice he's in red, which means technically he's like the rest of us, which of course he isn't. And he is carrying this awesome good cholesterol that can poke holes in parasites. You'll notice the monkey right next to him, his closest relative, the chimpanzee, doesn't have it. Why? We don't know why, because the chimps are full on in Tetsi land. I mean full on, and they get sick from this disease. So we have no idea why the chimpanzee has lost it. When something like this happens in evolution, it's generally because it was a bad thing to have. Okay? So maybe the chimp made a change in its gene that made it seriously bad, so it just lost it. But because it's gone now, we actually have no idea <laughs> what happened. Huh? It could have been that no, uh, no they, didn't, they never left Africa. But uh, yeah, okay, you mean... Population oh, a small population. Yes, 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 absolutely. The gorilla, his other closest relative, to which he may look a little more similar, does have it, and it's pretty similar to ours. We have not sequenced 60,000 gorillas, and I don't think we'll ever be able to do that because they are more protected than human beings. But um, at the moment in time, all the gorillas kind of look like his gene. But these are the interesting ones up here. 
So uh, look here, I've also put when the divergence occurred between the gorilla and the chimp. So the divergence in evolution was seven million years ago. So whatever the chimp did, it happened seven million years ago, way before my time. So I have no idea why they lost it. But up here, nine million years ago, this group of monkeys came onto the planet. And these are known as old world monkeys. And up here we have a sooty mangabe, a mandrel, and baboons. And for those of you who come from Africa, you know that Africa is teeming in baboons. And I'm sure for crop people, you must hate these guys. <laughs> right? They drive you crazy. Yes, they drive you crazy. OK. Oh. So what's cool about these, these primates, though, is that they are resistant to all African trypanosomes. So that means not just the animal ones, but the human ones as well. So they're even way ahead of the Ghanaians in this regard, because we presume that they got that resistance nine million years ago, all three of them. Are we following this? So when we selected for this gene, we did a relatively good job. We picked one that was good at killing six of the seven parasites. These guys, when they selected the gene, they did a way better job because they picked one that kills them all. Yes? Yes? OK. So before we move on, we have, to get, we have to do this audience participation slide. So who does not have the very good cholesterol? OK, this is important. How about the kangaroos in Australia? Remember, this is a primate-specific gene. Primate kangaroos, Australia. Nah. Good. Pandas, China. Dogs, Europe. Lion in the heart of Africa. Absolutely not. Cows. Cows. He's a monkey. It's a new world monkey. And? It's a primate. Right. So, so the, these continents split. Here's your new world monkey. Here are your old world monkeys. Then the gene was selected for. So these guys don't have it. Only the monkeys in Africa and all the primates and all the humans that came out of Africa. Got it? Great. All right. So guess what we want to do. So that means mice <coughs> don't have it either. So we took the baboon gene and we made a baboon's lytic factor in a mouse. Do you understand that? So we made a transgenic mouse. We gave the gene to the mouse because the mouse doesn't have it. And we asked, if we infect those mice with trypanosomes, what will happen to them. So here is a mouse that is just a mouse. You can see when we infect it with any African trypanosome, it dies very quickly, and it, there it is, upside down, dead mouse. If we give the mice the capacity to make the baboon lytic factor by giving the mice the genes, so that's the DNA that encodes that pore-forming protein, what you now see is the mouse is completely and utterly able to survive the challenge of that parasite. And so we show at a genetic basis that all you need is that gene, and only that gene, and you'll be completely protected from all African trypanosomes. Are we on the same page here? Good. So, I hope you agree. 
that it's bad to be cattle in Africa and it's much more fun to be a baboon. Especially because you don't get this disease of African trypanosomiasis. So, why is it bad to be a cow? Remember that there are many cattle in Africa that we treat them with all these trypanocidal drugs that resistance is rising actually against these drugs and a lot of them die and now I've understood that this is an issue in the soggy wetlands of Central Africa and not so much an issue in Sub-Saharan Sahel kind of areas. So what we tried to do first was some conventional breeding. So we know that there are these trypanotolerant cattle called Ndama that come from West Africa and they've been introduced, we think, into Africa about 3,000 years ago. They are tolerant. We don't know why they're tolerant. And what I mean by that is they get infected by the parasite. They carry the parasite. The parasite changes its coat every week, just like it would in any other mammal but they don't get sick. But we don't know why they don't get sick. But we know they don't get sick. But they are small, they are weak, they don't make a lot of milk, and they don't breed well, is what I am told by the community. And so the farmers would prefer a bigger cow, and in this instance I'm working out of Kenya, so in Kenya the cow they want is a boran. The boran was introduced 100 years ago. It's large and strong, so it can carry things. It's a great milk producer, and it's a great breeder. And apparently, it doesn't need a lot of water. Apparently. So they want a boran. The problem is, borans get really sick. when they get the infection and they look like those very thin skinny cattle that I've been showing you. So what did they do? They bred trypanotolerant cattle with a baran and the aim was can we get all the good traits into one animal, right? Conventional breeding. And so we want them to be large, strong, high milk producers, good breeders, but we want them to be tolerant so they don't get sick. So they did this for years and years and years because it takes a long time to get progeny out of cattle, right? Cattle have an eight-month gestation. Then you have to wait two years till they're grown up enough to produce. Then you have to wait another uh, nine months, sorry, for the babies to be born. And then you have to wait for those F2s to be old enough for you to start testing them. So after they did all of that, they found 10 different areas in the genome that seemed to map to good things. And they found that there were thousands of genes in those areas, so they could never pick which gene it was that was the good gene. They couldn't narrow it down. And it was unclear to them which ones were important because they never made the perfect animal. They never got what they wanted. They got little bits in one animal, little bits in another, but they never made the perfect animal. And of course, you know, when you do conventional breeding, it's, it's like this. Every time they breed, there's this big crossover of multiple different parts of your genetic material. So you never know where's the good guys and where are the bad guys. And then getting them all into one animal when they're all on different parts is really, really hard. This program has stopped because they were only funded to go to the F2. Technically, one could argue that they could keep on breeding and perhaps one day they'll get the perfect animal. Right? Perhaps. One day. Yes. So, we decided to take a sort of cutting-edge approach and give cattle one gene. 
So here is that pore forming protein. It's called apolipoprotein L. And what I want you to see is that there's a family of them. So by a family, what we mean is there was once one gene, and then it duplicated, and then it duplicated again, and then it duplicated again. And each one of those copies changes slightly from the original, and they may or may not have different functions. And they may or may not have any function. Sometimes they die, and they just don't have any function. So what I want you to see is that humans have got six copies. All these other ones have entirely different functions from this one. See the cow has got a copy of this one that we've termed number three, and maybe a couple of number six. Sheep, pigs, goats, chimps have everything except the one that you need to make the lytic factor. Remember, they lost it in evolution. So we want the cow to make this. So we want to give the cow this gene. Why did humans do this? We're not going to give it the human. If we gave it the human, it would be useless, right? Because then the cow could get infected by the, the other genes. two. So which gene are we going to give it? Whose gene? The baboon. Good. But before you do that, the way you make, you give um, farm animals genes is um, not as simple as the way you give mice genes or humans. So what you have to do first is prove that you can clone a bull. We went for a bull because ultimately we want to give sperm to get the gene distributed as fast as possible if people want it. So when a single copy is enough? Yes, we need, a, sing we need si a single copy to be sufficient. Good point. So the way you clone an animal is you take a skin cell from a young uh, animal, so it's, it's, it's got a long time to live. When they made Dolly the sheep, she was quite old when they took the cell from her breast tissue, and so she died quite young because she was already old when she was born. So we've learned from that, and so you take a skin cell from a very young animal, and you introduce, uh, in, oh, we're cloning, we're cloning right now. So then you remove the genetic material, the nucleus, from that skin cell. So you take that out. It's got two copies of every gene, right? It's got a copy from its mum and a copy from its dad because it's a skin cell. Mm -hmm. Yes? So you take that out and you put it into an enucleated oocyte. So that's an egg that has come from a donor and you've removed the nucleus out of that egg because that egg has got one copy because it's only mum and it's her, her, um, gonad, her sexual organs, her gonads, whatever you the call them. Young, no, the donor doesn't have to be young. And so you insert the nucleus from, this, from here into the egg. The egg now has two copies of every gene. It thinks, though it doesn't think, but it thinks it's been fertilized because it's got two copies of every gene. So it starts to reprogram, it starts to divide, and it makes a blastocyst or an embryo, which you then implant into a surrogate mum. So this is just like in vitro fertilization from this point on. It's exactly what happens with in vitro fertilization. So now you implant that into a surrogate mum, and you wait to see if they grow. Ooh, no, I don't want to join Cornell. Sorry about that. Let's turn that off. We've got it? So we've done that. We've done this in Kenya, and this paper is published. So you can look up um, the, the reference for this, this first cloning. So Tumayini apparently means hope in Swahili. And we chose that name on purpose. And Tumayini is this lovely creature here. He is three years old in this picture. So he grew up 
as an implanted embryo in a surrogate mum. He was then released into a field with 20 cows, lucky man, uh, when he was two years old. And he made a lot of them pregnant. So here we've got 007, I love it, and 008. 007, you know, duh, duh. Oh. And so this work was done by Bill Ritchie, who was one of the very first people who made Dolly the sheep. And he came to Kenya and he trained Yumi here in the art of making, trans, uh, of making cloning animals, sorry. And Yumi worked alongside with a fabulous African technician called Charity Mutati, who I don't have a picture of. And so they together, the team, created Tumaini. So Tumaini is living still, as are his progeny, and everybody seems to be happy. We're waiting till these little guys grow up to be of reproduction age, and then we'll make sure that they are fully reproductively okay. So yeah. So we started, I think it took them about four, four years? Yeah, about four years. Because um, Bill <coughs> immediately went to Africa and started training Yumi, <coughs> and she was a super efficient person. And so she was implanting blastocysts into surrogate moms within a year of being trained. And so then the rest was just waiting to see if they would grow and then if they could breed. She was super efficient. Question, um, kind of irrelevant. Is this a subspecies or is this a different species of cattle? Is this These are boran. These are the boran, the strong ones that they yeah, want. But, the, but this is a subspecies or it's a species or what? Vos indicus. Is that what you want? Um, it's a breed. Oh, okay. It's a breed? Bos Taurus yeah. and Bos Indicus, but I think this is Bos. I Indicus? I'm not a cattle breeder. I. Well, this is kind of irrelevant. <laughs> yeah. But you can look up the paper. Yeah. So Tumayini's out, he's published, so you feel free. Why aren't we moving? OK, that's backwards, forwards. OK, so now we have to introduce the baboon gene, right? So now we know we can clone an animal. The next step is introduce the gene. And so again, you take this, the very same cells that we used to make Tumayini. We kept them in the freezer. So we take those out, and we introduce the gene at this point here. The reason we have to do that is because we haven't figured out yet how to introduce the gene into the egg or at this point here. We just don't have the technology yet to do it. So the technology we have that works the best right now is to introduce the gene here, then take out this nucleus that has that new gene in it, put it into the enucleated egg, and then again wait to see the progeny. And remember, we're trying to give it just the one extra gene because it doesn't have it. It's got some family members, but it doesn't have that one. And the way we're doing that is this is what the DNA looks like inside of these animals, let's say. So here's the baboon's DNA, and there's the gene. So we're going to chop that out, and then we're going to stick it right here into the cow's DNA. And we're going to stick it alongside where all the other family members are so that it looks like just another copy. So these are tandem? Yeah. And see, here's the mouse. Just to show you, mouse have got a ton of them with various things stuck in between. And that's exactly what we did the mouse. We took this out and we stuck it in there so it looks like just another copy. But it's special because it makes this awesome, good cholesterol, right? None of their other genes do that. 
So the way we got it in there, I don't know if you noticed, I had a pair of scissors, scissors, and I said cut with CRISPR-Cas. So here's a question for you guys. I don't know what you've had in your, in your classes thus far, but does anyone know what CRISPR-Cas is? Yeah? Tell me. Did you hear that? Did you guys hear that? So this is a new kind of, of um, genetic modification that we call genome editing, right? And we're very specific about where we put something. There is no randomness to this event. We choose exactly where we want to put a gene. So this is very different from conventional breeding, which when you allow the chromosomes to switch and change as they please, you have no idea where anything ends up. Absolutely none whatsoever, which is why we're all such interesting people with individual personalities and looks, because you have no idea what's going to come out of the combination of a mother and a father. You only hope it's good. You get the good genes and not the bad ones, right? So with CRISPR-Cas, we can very precision cut the genome in a very specific place. And we do that because we guide that enzyme, the thing that does the cutting, we guide it there with a very specific sequence and we tell it, go find that sequence, cut there. Right? That's how we do it. So that's called precision editing. And so we're telling it we want it to cut here and here. So we tell the enzyme where to go. I think I have an image. Yes, there you go. Awesome bio, there's a whole nature biotechnology on CRISPR-Cas. And the reason we want to target is so that we just make another copy of the gene family. And we are making an assumption in doing that that we're not going to change any other part of the genome and nothing bad is going to happen as a consequence of making just one more copy. Okay, so that's the assumption that putting it exactly where we want is not going to make anything bad. And so once we've created this cow, it's in process, sorry, bull, we haven't made him yet. We're going to call him Zima, which apparently means the healthy bull. And the reason he'll be healthy is because he'll be carrying the baboon gene. He'll be resistant to animal infective parasites, and he'll also be resistant to human infective parasites, right? Because he's carrying the baboon gene, not ours. And it turns out that the cattle are quite bad for being reservoirs of human infective parasites because people keep their cattle much closer to them than they do any other animal. And so the tsetse fly, being lazy that it is, will bite, hello, the cow, and because we're in close proximity, will bite me. And so when the cows are infected with human infected parasites, you see uh, an increase in human infection in those areas. Okay, so there's a double whammy here. We protect the cow, but we protect the human as well. This is my cowboys. <laughs> These are all my cowboys, see? I am the boss, girls. These are my cowboys. Yeah. Yay. I have a lot of them all over the place. So, my question to you is, is this a good idea? I beg your pardon? We'll have more cattle in Africa, so we're going to get... Oh, you do? You do? I don't know. Do you? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Only cloned. Only cloned. Not GMO. It's only cloned. There's no GMO yet. I was involved in one of the monitoring research. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, so my understanding is that the testified traps and the sterile males, so he's talking about testified traps to tra trap the fly, and then sterile males so that, so that you can't make more babies. Because the testify is weird, it makes one baby that it carries with it inside, it's like the whole development from egg to pupa is inside, and then it pops out that pupa. I have no idea why these flies are so successful, given that they have this completely mad way of producing children. But there you go. Right. But but the so these traps and the ster sterile males work really well in the borders between Tetsi land and not Tetsi land. But when you get deep into the heart of Africa, there's just too many Tetsi flies. So they're fantastic for clearing the edges, but they're not so great for the middle. There's not worked so well in, deep in the heart of Africa. And then the other problem is the tabernids. So you get rid of the tetsi, but then the tabernid just moves in and becomes the mechanical transmitter of the parasite. Right? So it's not just tetsis. And like you mentioned, the Mutu, there is another breed, apart from the Indama, one of the Indama breeds in Nigeria, the Mutu breeds and the Tetsi. They are all resistant to the Right. Animal. Right. There's a bunch of Japanatora, yes. but the only cross they did was with the Indama and the Baran, so that's the only one I can tell you about. Yeah, I understand there's more tolerant. Okay, so what I told you, oh, maybe I didn't tell you, so what they treat their cows with right now, this is the choice that people have in Africa in order to treat their animals, is they treat them with these drugs called isometidium or homidium chloride, and they inject these intramuscularly into their cattle once a month to act as a prophylaxis. There's another one. I think the term baronil, but it's one of these. It's one of these chemicals. The issue with these guys are they're like ethidium bromide. Does anyone know what ethidium bromide is? So this is a carcinogen. It intercalates into the DNA, the genetic material of anything, and it mutates it. And so it stops it from replicating faithfully, and so the parasites die. But I worry about the cow and what's going on with the cells of the cow because it's got DNA too, right? And when I ask people what about the cow, they say to me, oh, they're fine. And I say, oh, so then why don't we treat ourselves with this? Why we do, would we do such a thing? So that tells me Maybe it's not okay, but they insist that there's no deleterious effect to the cattle, and so this is the treatment. You know, as a scientist, it makes me think. Milk. So, the milk, right. So here's to your point, what are we gonna do about making more cows in Africa? So remember, 
It's bad to be a cow in Africa. They get cachexia, but that doesn't stop them passing gas, and it certainly doesn't stop them breathing. So the cattle are the culprits for some of the highest greenhouse gas release of livestock, right? So what this shows you here is how much CO2 they release per kilogram of cow. And so everything in terms of greenhouse gases seems to be how much CO2 is released per kilogram of X, be it a plant, be it an animal, right? And that's how we compare things. So if you look, you'll see over here that the greenhouse gas emissions are somewhere between 150 CO2 kilogram equivalents per kilogram of animal. And then here, it looks much worse, right? We're in the thousands. So it looks like there's more cows in Africa. But there isn't. They're just skinny like this. So if we made them healthy, then the levels would look like this. These what pictures are what? No, no, this, this animal has sleeping sickness. But I, I, I'm sure drought would do exactly the same to them. But this animal has um, nagana, which is what the disease is called in cattle. So you think this is because of the drought as well? I mean, I'm not saying that African trips are the only problem with cattle in Africa. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. But if we improve their health because of this disease, then surely we'll shift this in this direction. Right? If we, no? I don't know how much we would shift it, but we should shift it in the right direction. We can stop here, it's time. We'll stop here. We can, we can discuss this. We can discuss this after lunch in the discussion session. Will you come back? What time? Uh, <laughs> this discussion session? 2.45 or something, I think. <laughs> come back.